Well, hello there, and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 376. That's tres seis seis. How are you doing? Right? Tres seis seis. Yeah, should it be that? Yeah? Tres seis seis. Bueno, 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 bueno. It should be that, innit? Tres seis seis. Tres seis seis. Uno, dos, tres, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete. No, seis, siete. Okay, it's tres siete seis. There we go. We got there in the end. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great, amazing. If it's your first time watching this show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five star review, download the show, share it with your friends, put it in an envelope, send it as attachment via email, run it across the road to your friend, and put it underneath their doormat. I don't ask him for not, no, not asking for too much if you don't mind. And of course, if you want to support the show via Patreon, you're more than welcome to. The link should be down below in the description. It's patreon.com for Agostino. It's patreon.com for Agostino, and join me on patreon for little as one dollar or one pound equivalent to whatever currency you use in your home country and what do you get for that you ask you get the entire audio um of this show in full hd before it comes out anywhere else before it comes out on itunes before it comes out on spotify before if it's even released on youtube you get the full access to my entire audio um, format of this podcast directly via patreon so make sure you support the show or via patreon don't delay today visit the patreon link in the show note descriptions <sighs> but yeah but apart from that how are you feeling you feeling good i'm feeling um i'm feeling as good as i can feel um whatever wherever you are reading or wherever you are listening wherever you are watching this show we have unfortunately got some very bad news in the uk we're inevitably going to go into a second lockdown um lockdown number two as it's been um quite beautifully uh <laughs> titled as is going to not only decimate you know the existing parts or whatever has survived the first lockdown in our economy it's also going to if anything relegate us to an entire year calendar year basically in lockdown i don't see this coming i don't see any light in the tunnel i think if we do go under um some level of lockdown which is going to be confirmed in the morning supposedly i've been told or from what i read online actually um so if that's the case then i don't see this lightening up until what the end of the year maybe towards the end of december by that time the year is completely done so um yeah a bit distressing in that regard i think instant kind of feelings about it from me as a as a concerned citizen is that i would say i'm not i'm not against it in one in one in one way right i understand that something needs to be done i understand that they um the government can't allow the numbers to just keep creeping up right you can't allow for us to get in a position where effectively we're having to scramble for beds we're having to scramble for ppe and all that other stuff we can't have that happen so we have to kind of limit the numbers somewhat and hope because they don't mention even too much in the news they don't even talk about deaths too much you know how they wrangle off how they just list off the numbers of deaths is always a bit disconcerting to me right it lacks real humanity but i guess in this sense or in in the space that we're in now at the moment there is no time to mourn anyone's death really we were trying to in a weird way without sounding hyperbolic we're trying to save the world in it everyone in their own little way so there's no time to even mourn anyone just yet but um they can't let the numbers of people getting contaminated or people that are ending up dying or passing away unfortunately creep up or get anywhere close to crazy as they were prior to us locking down the beginning of the year about march his time so i understand something needs to be done but some part of me thinks being heavy-handed and essentially closing pubs which is what's gonna happen in the uk we're gonna have a 10 p.m curfew which is going to mean most uh bars and pubs and restaurants and other hospitality places won't be allowed to open after 10 p.m which will mean you know punters will have to leave the establishments before 10 i'm assuming for people to be able to clean down and whatnot so that will effectively kill whatever trade some of these bar pubs, bar, pubs bars and restaurants had um during um you know the pandemic um some bars and pubs were able to restart their business they were able to kind of you know um work stuff out by opening up a beer garden maybe if you're lucky enough like the cause and you had another 
area you could use they turned it into costa del tottenham the people did some interesting things in it but by and large when you read between the lines or when you register direct interviews from the owners most of the people or most of the landlords uh most of the business or well, these small business owners were saying it still wasn't enough they were just do they had to do what to do to make sure to keep the lights on but in terms of actually uh you know achieving any kind of profit in terms of returning to anything like they were making prior to lockdown it wasn't even scratching the surface so for these same establishments to be expected to go under lockdown and somehow still come out of the other side is really concerning we haven't heard any news from the government about um support in terms of loans bursaries whatever it may be to assist them during these hard times so that's going to be very difficult and um, if you know anything about the UK you know anything about you know colder climate countries bars and pubs are usually the place that everyone goes to sort of socialize when it's the colder months of the year in it so for them to take that away um, from the citizens is a bit hard to take but again I think if we do want to get to a place where we eventually go back to normal we're going to have to sacrifice some things some some of our guilty pleasures and if we're being completely honest if we're you know if you're from the UK you would know we were never really in the proper lockdown anyway to begin with it was always kind of hands-off approach even when Boris nearly died right the Tories still kind of failed to ramp up the response they were still sort of quite lily livered and you know um, waiting for somebody else to take responsibility on the issue and essentially they just allowed the public to kind of dictate how they approached it in a weird way right they encouraged us to go out to eat and help out they encouraged us to go and do our summer holidays in neighboring european union countries they um they they encouraged us to go back to the bars right because the bars thing was the one that really struck a chord in me that was when i actually knew it was over when they reopened the bars but then they allowed you to sit indoors because i always had the impression that they were just going to reopen the bars and allow most places to have extended seating on the pavement oh sorry on the yeah on the pavement um and or or allow people to stand up on sort of like you know to have, to be standing on these sort of like you know high tables that you sometimes have in bars but i didn't think they'd have tables and chairs back out again but they did i thought it would just be a place where you can go pick up drinks maybe stand around if there wasn't you know make sure there's maybe 16 people max in the pub that maybe fills 100 people that kind of spaced out i thought that was what they were going to do i didn't expect them to just reopen the pubs as per normal with just social distancing that was never going to be a sustainable long-term um alternative or you know solution to what's currently going on at the moment with the pandemic so that was the issue i think they didn't they weren't hard enough they weren't clear enough and then by the time they realized all the money that was essentially being bled out of the uk economy by the time they realized about how many business will go under which would negatively affect their bottom line they then decided to react and do something and by that time it was too late people already built up bad habits people already fed up too that's another thing too there is a bit of covid fatigue especially in the uk because of just a lack of leadership because of lack of clear direction even just you know earlier on today um you had matt Hang Hancock, you know, waffling on on Good Morning Britain. You had the two scientists being pretty clear in their breakdown about things, and supposedly you're going to have Boris trying to articulate this very um, distressing bit of news to the public and make it seem somehow what inspiring make it seem somehow that there wasn't the end of the world he's going to have to try and convince or spin it in a way that's going to be um that's not going to be received the way he thinks it's going to be received right and he's never been really been good at that he's not the best you know he's not the best charmer in the world in that regard he he, he might be charismatic in his own little way but not in terms of dealing with conflicts not in that solution at all and um further details are here i guess the news on my end further leaked because i'm following this guy on twitter who's a good follower from, from the uk called jonathan downey um, um, he's part of the hospitality union and i think he's also part of i think it's eat what's that place in dawson uh oh yeah in uh street feast so if you've ever been there sort of like a multi-vendor marketplace where people have their own little you know street food um uh restaurants basically and they sell all different sort of stuff from all over the world but um he released some details regarding it. Um, this is his thread here on Twitter. His post said new curfew details um, are released. All bars and pubs, restaurants and other hospitality in the UK will be required to close by 10 p.m. from this Thursday. Hospitality sector will be restricted by law to table service only, which is something we've already been doing. But this is really, 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 really um, distressing news. And again, another sign for me that 
we're not going to be out of lockdown, especially in the UK. I'm saying, I, I said in the beginning anyway, from when we when um, we first went into lockdown and, you know, we first got reports of this crazy virus that was coming over from China and, you know, decimated parts of Italy and took out place, part huge swaths of Spain. I was very adamant in the beginning that I didn't see this clearing up until the end of the year. I was guaranteed that was the case because I just assumed we would kind of be, you know, plodding along in terms of responses it'll take us a while to kind of get in a flow of actually doing a lockdown because even parts of italy and spain they were very you no know, there were videos of people going crazy for the most part most of their citizens were very um uh agreeable in that sense right they were they were willing to um sacrifice their own personal liberties um in the hope of extending everyone else's life do you know what i mean and i think in the uk we never really had that kind of response no one really reacted to it in that way i don't know why it is it was it conspiracy theories was it um dodgy science no idea but i just don't see how this is going to change those people's minds because if anything the more time has gone on the more people that were sort of like you know pro lockdown have probably switched to the other side they're like you know what we should just open everything back up again so you're gonna have have a hard time convincing those people but this is basically the outline of what the plan is so it was embargoed from the 20 yeah it's continuous says the prime minister is to address the nation on latest coronavirus measures the prime minister is to set out a new measures to tackle the coronavirus as uk moves to alert level four we were never in free anyway that free alert level thing was a whole lot of crap right and if you're wondering what this alert level is essentially the uk decided to put together this weird nando's where's the where's the thing this nando's little graph right that essentially we could use as an idea of knowing how far along the covid recovery plan we were on but if you live in the uk you would know that we were never on free they tried to make it seem like we we're on free right which is gradual relaxation of restrictions and the virus and general circulation we were never there we were always on four sometimes even even on five so i felt like they prematurely moved through the stages in an effort to kind of show safe face or to reassure the public or to save our summer or to get us to eat our help out whatever nonsense they pushed that forward so now them saying that we're going back to four is really um it's insulting to all of our intelligence in it because we know we weren't on four we, we didn't deserve to be on four whatsoever that, that's that's that goes without saying um he continues that all bars and pubs with hospitality will be required to close by 10 p.m. On Thursday, hospitality for food and drink will be restricted to law by table service only, which is a really strange thing to go into a UK pub and have people coming over to your table and asking what drink and what you'd like to eat. It's a very, very strange experience, especially if you're used to going to a typical uh, British pub. It's like, you know, you go and order yourself at the bar. You know what I mean? No one ever brings anything to you. Uh, they might come over to you and tell you to fuck off if you're being a bit too drunk but they're never going to come and serve you at a table so it's very odd to get used to that sort of stuff so it continues says the prime minister will today uh say, setting out next steps to tackle the spread of coronavirus as cases continue to rise in the uk and across europe he'll confirm pubs bars restaurants and other hospitality in england will be required to close by 10 p.m from this thursday the prime minister also said hospitality sector will be restricted by law of table service only cabinet will meet this morning ahead of the prime minister setting up the changes in the statement to parliament he also is to bring together a cobr committee cabinet ministers of first minister uh, ministers and first ministers to discuss the surging cases he'll make an address to the nation later in the day on further days he will continue uh, he will confront the virus in line um with the latest scientific evidence advice sorry and the whole the role everyone can continue to play in tackling the spread including by following the social distancing guidelines wearing face coverings and washing hands regularly again i think those three things people are pretty much okay with i just think it's the telling people not to go meet their friends because now we've got that rule of six right um telling people not to go to pubs after a certain time that's going to be the difficult one to kind of convince everybody to uh agree to it's just going to be very very hard i think so i think most people can even if they don't really agree what's the, they think it's a pandemic they don't think it's real whatever it may be i think you can convince the wide majority of people to be like hey social distance stand on your little sticker when you're queuing up at tesco express um wear something across your face you know um wash your hands you know the, people can get down with that but when you start telling people that they can't go hug their grandma they can't go and see their parents they can't go meet other friends that live you know that live on their own that's when people are going to be like you know what get fucked do you know what I mean so that's going to be the difficult one um and number 10 spokesman said no one anticipates the challenges and the new measures will pose to many individuals and businesses anyway so that's
that's that response so then obviously the restaurant industry uh one popular blog in the uk here called hot diners obviously um broke some of the news as well and got some um reactions from people in the industry across twitter who weren't and obviously pleased with the news it says the following so this guy called steve parley i don't know what he does he says stevie parley sorry he says the following making restaurants bars and pubs close at 10 p.m is just so stupid no evidence will help no reasoning no impact except to make everything even harder for an industry already on its knees what a load of shit what a bunch of idiots how did we get here interesting question because i've been wondering that too right if you're going to respond by telling you know bars and pubs not to open after a certain time because i don't know is that even because the law so far we don't know if it's a curfew that means that you can't go outside after 10 p.m it seems like it's a curfew in terms of going out to hospitality venues right if that's the case they'd have to kind of prove unequivocally that the hospitality industry is the reason why we're getting these numbers these spikes in cases and stuff they'd have to prove one way or the other that hey whenever we've seen vi data that in these towns or cities in the uk where there's a high concentration of bars and pubs the very next week or two weeks however much time they need to find out where or to kind of locate where the spikes are we get a spike in cases from people who said they were in that area that's the only way but if they can't prove that then you know i don't see what closing pub, what closing bars and pubs does then another side of it would be that from my limited knowledge i would assume that bars pubs and restaurants might be the best places to go during the night or in general indoors because they're having to do so much to just ensure that it's of a safe standard right in terms of having stuff wipe stuff down wearing face coverings most stuff mem members do in pubs and bars or at least a face shield um track and trace at the start before you go in some places have the um, temperature gun right they're doing a lot of things to ensure that they're providing the best possible space the safest space for their punters so if anything you would imagine they would be best they would be in the best place to make the necessary adjustments in order to um work within you know the current pandemic limits like you'd imagine so so that's the thing that's bizarre but anyway who what do i know another lady called lisa markle said restaurants and pubs are closed at 10 p.m just a quick reminder according to the php or PHE, which is what uh i guess this is week 37 of the covid outbreaks by an institution in england supposedly 46 percent of the cases come from um care homes 21 from education 18 from workplaces eight from other which is funny because matt hancock in the interview with good morning britain was badgering on about people going back to work and kids being in school which is you know gives rise to the allegation that the government's more concerned about keeping pretty Monje open and making sure your kids are in school than they care about the actual economy right they don't care about that and i guess the schools maybe benefit the government in one way shape or form in terms of kickbacks we don't know allegedly let's say that and then of course work you know the deal is with that one right there's some really um nefarious ties involved there so it's interesting that none of the evidence points to the hospitality industry being um as responsible as other places right for instance in this graph it shows that hospitality or food outlets and restaurants are responsible for maybe five percent of the outbreaks five percent and you deciding to close them you know at 10 p.m it doesn't really make any sense does it and again i don't mind it i think this this probably should have been a rule at the beginning when we started lockdown we probably should have had it really tight and then loosened or kind of eased the, re the restrictions as time went on right the same thing they did in new york right um that was probably a good example they've only started to recently starting to you know relax some of the regulations and allow people to kind of you know meet in bigger groups and all that sort of stuff but in general it was a slow steady process but for some reason in the uk we didn't do it even though our prime minister nearly died from this bloody virus it still didn't wake them up it continues here another guy called ed cummings said was boris johnson bitten by a restaurant as a boy that's pretty funny um a guy called adam k said coronavirus is, is around during the day as well this not fucking dracula which is interesting right that they decide to do that yeah the timing thing is interesting like if 10 p.m is like the peak time but i guess in the government's um defense maybe they're thinking more along the lines of like if we close at 10 that means it's going to give people less time to mingle right is that true could it be no that's not true right that doesn't matter if i'm if i'm at the pub with my friends and we're getting on it i'm not gonna go home at 10 p.m i'm still gonna be outside no matter how cold it is and and i'm sure some places some of the more um let's say risky risque establishments won't mind you know uh 
won't mind sort of doing lock-ins and especially if they've got partners that have been supporting them from the very beginning of lockdown and they, they want to kind of give back or they just know that they can trust them they're definitely going to do some you know not so legal things to get around it because that's a lot of money on the table they're missing out on right unless people are drinking really early in the day i don't know but i'd assume most people are still going to the pubs or the bars at 5 p.m so that's not a lot of time to get people to go in and drink right so um yeah that's going to be very concerning going forward and then another one here last one is from hugh smith right he said did it ever go away to somebody in response to someone saying time for a long boozy lunch to return so i guess in one way the good thing they've done is that because it's going to be starting on thursday there's not going to be any chance of anybody because i thought my initial reaction is another article here from bbc my initial reaction was if they decide to because obviously they announced they're going to announce on tuesday right so I mean, my thing was, if they were going to say, hey, it's going to come into place on Monday, it would have created an entire surge of people going out on the weekend to get their last night of freedom in it. So at this rate, because it's going to start on Thursday, it gives the pubs time to kind of, you know, get some of those rules in place. And then by the weekend, well, by the time the weekend comes along, everyone should be already aware of what they sh are allowed to do or not allowed to do by that time. So I guess that's probably the best thing they've done in that regard. And the last article here from bbc says covid pubs restaurant to close at 10 p.m it says this sector will also be restricted by law to table service only the measures are set to be announced by the prime minister in parliament here and you never knew speaking da, 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 da. what difference will it make it says here um by analyst nick Trigo, it says people are understandably asking what difference closing at 10 p.m makes coupled with the table service but what ministers hope is that the move along with the rule of six at the time that came into force last week will act as a warning to the public efforts to curb the virus and need to be rebounded um we double sorry oh that's true and i guess i'll just it, it will put the seat it'll sow the seed in people's heads right that we're still not out of it i guess that's the main important thing here it says what remains to be seen is whether any of the restrictions will accompany this move he says behind the scenes both ministers and their advisors have argued over what is the right thing to do and how much the public will be willing to tolerate um it seems inevitable that it, do you find it funny as well we haven't heard anything from dominic cummings and he's been pretty quiet hasn't he that guy interesting it seems inevitable that the virus will continue to spread what's um that's what uh uh, respiratory viruses do during winter um, especially one especially one for which there is limited immunity and no vaccine but how quickly and wildly something uh, no one knows the risk of trying to suppress the virus and the government will soon find itself having to make another decision about further steps which is the more interesting part of it is if this doesn't work then we just have to get them to the realization that the only way we're going to combat especially in the uk other places are okay because i think people are a little bit more um, civic minded but here I think we'd have to come to a realization that we're probably going to have to resort to herd immunity. We're probably going to have to resort to herd immunity, um, you know, copy the Swedish model. I'm not too sure how that, how well that's going to work because, you know, for the, from what I've seen in Sweden, they still, they still had a high number of deaths as well per, per capita. Um, and they are people who I would say would listen to their government if they told them, hey, don't go to this area, stay two meters apart. They sort of would abide by the rules to some degree. I just don't think we're going to abide by them. So the only real solution for the UK is herd immunity in some sort of clumsy way. We just figure it out. Or there's a vaccine that we develop and test pretty soon. But considering everything I've read in between the lines between that guy that from WME who said essentially Coachella won't happen until 2022 summer. He didn't say 2021, he said 2022. And I take into consideration how quickly this new Premier League season started. The fact that they decided to just give the what players six week break and then start straight away. They didn't wait until October because they would have waited until October. They probably wouldn't have been able to restart the league, especially with these new um, restrictions coming into place in it. So things might have got worse by that time. So for them to decide to do it so quickly, the Coachella thing, all the people that have money on the line, everyone that has skin in the game, I'm looking at their decisions and that's sort of informing my view on how the economy will reopen. And I just think, or just how would stuff get back to normal? I just think there's too much money involved in those sectors, you know, football, live music. Um, if they're saying next year, or if they're saying to 2022 and the football season is jam-packed this, this year, I would assume that we're probably looking at late 2021. That's my prediction. Maybe let's say August as well.
as in stuff gets back to normal as in we're like packed in restaurants we're going back to department stores we're in clubs i think i'm saying for the uk anyway i'm saying the summer of 2021 100 percent or the end of summer that'd be august that's my opinion um let me know what your guesses are and it continues here said how far ministers are prepared to go every restriction that is taken has a negative consequence to society but the nature of the virus means lives will undoubtedly be lost and the more it spreads balancing two harms will definitely define the next six months or the next six or 12 months actually so yeah let's see what happens man um again it's terrible terrible for everybody involved in the uk i think um if you live in the uk it's really bad news if you have a business within the hospitality sector it's even worse news for you and um, it just goes to proving that our government is completely inept incredibly incompetent um clueless short-sighted um lacking in clarity um sometimes purposely vague right it's just an annoying clusterfuck of a situation where you just think to yourself hey man if you just would have taken it seriously in the beginning even if it meant losing some friends even if it meant pissing people off just if you would have just taken it serious we could have even still had the summer right they forced they didn't force us but they kind of they kind of gently encourage us to go and visit some of our you know allies in the european union and go to bolster their economy places like greece well, plus in italy spain they were really encouraging people to go there right um to boost tourism and yeah if they would have just taken it seriously in the beginning we probably still could have done that but under much better circumstances now i think there's no coincidence that these numbers are spiking just when summer ends when of course flu season starts and when everyone's back from their holidays right it's no coincidence that these numbers are spiked so much so it's just a bit like god man you guys did such a terrible job and that's the funny thing about, it's all about politics like again i've never really paid attention to it but prior prior to lockdown but now you know there's not really much to really be keep attention well to keep my attention so looking at it, it's just interesting to see like just how um uh just how kind of freestyle it kind of feels on it it's just like they just it's like they're kind of making up as they go along some of these politicians and then the other aspect of it is the fact that they're never really held accountable until their party sort of like you know um elected out of office um of our parliament they never they never actually not punished but you never get pulled up for what you did wrong during your term it's just a thing that you just did at the time but it's not like someone could categorically say you were wrong and you have to kind of fess up to it and say yeah i was wrong i did this i came up short here here's where these are lessons i've learned hopefully the person that come in behind me you know um can learn from that and not repeat them right it doesn't happen that way it just you get you know you get bounced out of parliament and you know that's it you just keep on moving on and doing your thing doing private speaking engagements and a couple of zoom calls at tv stations but that's it you don't get reprimanded whatsoever so i don't see how that's a very good um platform or you know ecosystem to encourage critical thinking or to encourage some level of practicality in these situations or foresight it's just not going to encourage that because you're rewarding the wrong things you're rewarding people for being not conniving but for knowing how to play the game and i don't know man in, in, especially in this sort of moment the last thing we need is career it's co is career politicians playing the game we need people who can actually care about their citizens who care about their constituents who care about their local community to kind of step up and say hey here's what needs to be done a b c and d we need to sacrifice this that and that do you know what i mean we're in this together blah 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 but instead no we get this flipping silly you know bootleg flipping nando's restaurant list of options in it. absolute shambles but hey let me know if you're in the uk and you're um <laughs> and you're waking up to that news let me know what your first impressions are what do we do next what do we do next anyway moving on moving on in moving on up um big news actually let's change the tone of the conversation big news over the weekend um the team behind Greece Müller, one of my most favorite clubs in berlin a club that i visited a few times but maybe not as many times as i should have because now it's permanently closed but fret no more because the team behind Greece Müller have revealed their new venue called riviere sudust which i'm led to believe is called is um german for southern southern area right a southern area 
or at or river southern or something i don't know along the way anyway whatever in the former brewery and it looks banging right so far no real pictures of the inside or video footage because you know as um per typical in the berlin techno or dance scene you're not really allowed to take any videos or images inside these venues because they allow people to have a, a real this is like a true safe space right you're allowed to go in there and absolutely let your hair down get up to any kind of nonsense that you want to get up to without feeling the pressure that somebody's going to sneak a picture or a selfie of you um you know in a dark room somewhere getting a bit sweaty so this is news from our resident advisor says part of the whatever that word is space open to the public last weekend i think they had their opening this weekend just passed they had part three parts friday saturday sunday um again once things reopen and things settle down one of the first spots i'm visiting again i'm i really miss Chris Mueller, man one of my more favorite clubs i love the little outdoor um adult you know fun zone obviously sitting on the side of the lake when the sun's coming up smoking a cigarette even i don't smoke and pretending you're cool and just generally getting up to all sorts of nonsense in those little bushes like it's just one of the best places man but anyway it's article from ryan's advisor said the following the team behind the closed berlin club grace Mueller, have opened a new very a new venue called rivier sudust right is that how you pronounce it R- rivier rivier sudust rivier sudust in a former uh barn baron quill brewery in wherever that word is the outdoor section of the venue dubbed the beer garden the bear garden or beer garden um opened to the public last weekend with doors now open daily from 2 p.m it's unclear when the rest of the space will open as september the first dancing inside is still forbidden in, in berlin which is odd so that's how they, they're getting away with it by doing these open airs which they're you know synonymous for they they know how to do them you know with their eyes closed they've got clubs at cc first out of just you know essentially one big open air club but um that's how they're getting around the dancing in berlin so in a month since leaving this old venue in neuklin the team have hosted events at the other two clubs in outer Mund and polygon the original grease opened in 2011 wow on the site of a former pasta factory so that's cool isn't it they've gone from pasta to beer it would be cool if the actual restaurant that was on the site then changed then had a menu that allowed you to have that pasta and beer that'd be pretty cool wouldn't it It'd be a great way to kind of acknowledge um the history of that place uh da, da, they were forced out of the venue by february or by owners siag property um hundreds of people went in the streets to protest read one just account here but it's some pictures and then i've got a couple and so that's i guess the beer garden place and then some cool little light installations on the outside and then there's this really cool person on twitter on sorry instagram decided to take some images of the outside and kind of give us a feel of what it kind of looks like so i guess that might be the main dance floor area i'm not too sure this all little meshy netted area around you of some place it reminds you of the kind of um design they have in um deck mantle i forgot in the shelter right they have the sort of like mesh um cargo the kind of mesh camo net sort of thing right um and then next slide you have the queue some of the queue pictures here again no idea where the dance rows because no pictures are allowed indoors i'm not sure if they're going to build out this entire open space or if it's just going to be left open um that was part of the beauty of grease Mueller, really it was a little bit you know busted a little bit diy it looked like you know it looked like it'd been designed by like a team of like 10 people over the course of 20 years right things kind of stuck all over each other you know nooks and crannies all over the place but the main thing i liked about grease Mueller was the actual dance for itself right with all the little tinted um windows right so when the light was seeping through um early in the morning when you're dancing and sweating your ass off and feeling a little bit glum and maybe coming down a little bit having that light burst through just gives you another jolt of energy so that was awesome so maybe they'll do the same sort of thing here maybe letting in a lot of natural light but i don't know again if they've got they're pro- i'm assuming they've got like a dance floor space that's a little bit more or that's probably getting sorted out now at the moment right they've probably got the opportunities to do two things at once Ho- have host open air parties and also build out the entire dance floor and get that a1 before it gets opened but yeah i'm assuming that's the long queue you probably get checked here uh, and they're doing it pretty well here because i remember i did sign up to it even though i wasn't gonna go but um you have to sign up for a ticket sort of waiver thing online on their site you then get sent that and then that confirms you can actually go to the venue to buy a ticket and i'm assuming when you queue you then get given a ticket based upon the register details you registered prior so they can have those for track and tracing purposes so they go above and beyond to make sure everyone in there is safe from what i've seen um so that looks cool again more um yeah i guess that might be the 
I'm not, I don't know. Is that the dance floor? I don't think it is. But regardless, that's the light insulation there we're seeing here. And then again, more pictures of this place. Uh, nice heavy bike rack on the outside. Um, the, the, the queue on the outside. So yeah, I really can't wait to go, man. I'm 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 really excited. Again, part of the beauty of going but the of going clubbing in Berlin is the fact that you don't know what you're gonna see, right? So there's no images inside of the dance floor. There's no real videos of the inside. If there are videos of the inside, they're videos with you know with obviously the phone cameras. Um, uh, lenses you know stick it over so you can't actually see what it looks like you just hear the music that DJ is playing and screams and hollering on the dance floor so it does build up build up a weird sense of anticipation that you don't get in any other sense walk of life really there's nothing else I can think of in modern society especially now that you have to wait for and you don't know what it looks like you just have to kind of hope when you get there when you when it comes with the post it's going to be good right you see everything you're going to buy whether it's technology you know electronics clothing whatever you see it yeah there's no way you can so to go to so to, to to kind of experience berlin club culture it's a bit of a sensory reset right you know how they say you do that thing online what's it called it's called a dopamine uh reset right or dopamine detox right where you essentially you cut yourself off from all electronics all social media all screens for the best part of what seven days so you can reset your dopamine level so that you can easily slowly but surely get into a space where you can sit down and read a book for an hour without touching your phone or whatever it may be and um i think going clubbing in berlin does the same sort of thing to you you were the first sort of times that you go because you soon you quickly realize that hey the pace that i go when i'm at home isn't the same pace i can go out over there because places stay open uh they open up early open up later but they stay open way way late way uh later in the day so you can essentially you know places like Berlin or even most places in berlin you can stay out from friday all the way until monday if you want to so it requires another it requires a different approach to clubbing you can't go out there the same way that we do here where you're preaching hard at home you're preaching on the street before you get there and, and as you're going into the club you're just about hanging on you can't really do that in berlin that's not the best way to get about um to kind of maneuver around the city because you know the door guys or the pickers on the doors themselves aren't just you know um heavy-handed security guards they're actually part of the club themselves they kind of help to dictate or to basically craft the um the temporal atmosphere of the club right based upon the clientele they take a quick look at you they somehow are able to discern your vibe what you're about what you stand for by a couple of glances which you know can seem unfair can seem a little bit uh, draconian can seem somewhat prejudiced um but whatever it is it does work once you get in that's the thing once you get into most of these places regardless of what they are like even if it's a place like same heads right you go in and you're like okay cool i get why they're wankers on the outside because it's special on the inside everyone there looks like they've been picked and chosen specifically to add something to the atmosphere and re very rarely very rarely have i been anywhere when i went out in berlin and i felt like you know what this has been a shit night because so and so made it dead it doesn't happen man it really doesn't so um that's that yeah so i'm looking forward to going but it's just wow just to remember just how it feels like to go to some a, a club in berlin and have no idea what it looks like on the inside just going you know blindly but of course you know i trust the gris Müller people they put they had one of the best clubs in berlin for you know a very very long time and only had to close due to you know planning permission all that sort of malarkey so it wasn't as if they like closed because they weren't popular they were flipping popping you know cocktail de more being one of their bigger nights and then someone here actually posted a video um from the old grease media that i thought i'd play for you quickly here yeah, it's really cool but i can't lower the volume so this again a little warning for you guys if you've got your volume set to high please lower it in three two one <laughs> And as you can tell from the songs playing, it's the more of all the clubs in Berlin. Maybe Roses is another good example. In uh, uh, is it Friedrichstein? Where is it? 
It's in Kreuz- it's in Kreuzberg, right? Maybe Rhodes is another one. There's not this is one of the and same heads too being a good another good example. It's one of the rare places in Berlin where they don't essentially just stick to techno. It's a bit more of a looser music policy. It gets a bit fun. It gets a little bit silly. It gets a bit camp. Um, it's just a good time. It really is a good time. Um, again, so I'm happy to see them um, opening up a new spot. I can't wait to go to that place once it reopens. Or River Sudust. Is that what it's called? River Sudust. Um, again, loads of great um, gigs and parties coming up here. We see on the list. They've got one on the 24th with um records who's playing here chris liebling oh okay interesting djs and beer guys is finally playing out and link uh, uh spencer parker radio slave okay that'll be a pretty interesting one to see them the guys do it and i'll be interested to see their review but yeah loads of good nights that they're putting on here coming up oh this what's it cyanide open air this has already got 395 people um confirmed on ra this is interesting isn't it so yeah, Clara Coop, DJ Hyperdrive, Hector Oates, Scott Balsi, Nini H, Nudri Beer, SPFGA. So yeah, it's a flipping solid lineup. So yeah, keep an eye out if you're interested and check them out. And then again, I, you can trust them with your night out. You definitely can from my limited experience. Okay, next on the list, what else are we going to talk about here? Oh yeah, this is a big one, isn't it? So um, I wasn't familiar with um, with how big Ben Shapiro's operation was, and I didn't know that he was doing big things like this because I just, I guess, because you're really so used to just seeing somebody arguing with kids on student campuses, right? Um, you know, sunning them or destroying them, as they say on these YouTube titles, or going on various podcast shows. You just assume he's just one guy with a podcast, right? You don't assume he's running an entire news network. And I didn't really get that at first. So I guess Daily Wire is a big deal. Um, Ben Shapiro's platform, so much so that he's decided to move his headquarters from Los Angeles to Nashville. So he's sort of following the Joe Rogan template. But essentially, what he's doing is what a lot of uh, people that work in the entertainment industry in LA have finally decided to do because I guess LA is just untenable now right no one can live in la the homelessness problem has got way too crazy um of course the response to covid wasn't the best they've got the forest fires they've got the protests the looting the riots just a complete shit of a situation so i guess if you're ben shapiro and you are running a media network or, or whatever you'd call it is a media, a media company the daily wire you'd want to be best you want to be in a city that kind of best provides you with a platform for you to kind of get out whatever content that you're doing to the widest group of people as possible and obviously provide a good platform, a good space for your employees to work. But I'd imagine living and working in LA during these times, especially, you know, what was it, a democratic run state, you know how these guys are, if you're a Republican, you're definitely going to have an issue with how they go about doing everything in that state. So when it's, you know, when it's kind of during this, when it's in the context of, uh, the pandemic it definitely makes it look worse so i definitely understand this but it's just it just took me back anyway because i just didn't know daily why i was that heavy to be honest i just assumed it was just you know um sort of ben shapiro running it similar to how joe rogan does it right he had his jamie or whatever people behind the background i didn't know it was like 75 people staff so this is from deadline it said daily wire some headquarters from los angeles to nashville it says the daily wire conservative media company started by ben shapiro jeremy boring and caleb robinson plans to move his headquarters from los angeles to nashville uh, boring said that a move um, had been made due to the declining quality of life in a city including high housing costs and homelessness which is again a big issue right um in itself but to just imagine the amount of money that's leaving LA or leaving the state of California and going to other states because of their poor reaction or poor response to COVID because of them, you know, taking it. Cause that's the one thing I noticed too, when I went to LA and this was what, 2017, um, number one was, I think this was might've been during just after, uh, Trump was ragging on Mexicans. I didn't like, you know, again, first time being in LA, I've not I've got, I've got limited American experience. I went to New York once for a boys holiday in like 2014 or something. So I don't really know much about the States in terms of being on the ground. Well, first thing I noticed when I get to LA, mad Mexicans. So I was like, wow, how could Trump be saying so much disparaging stuff about Mexicans when they're essentially um, holding up the entire economy of California, right? You get rid of Mexicans in LA and I don't know what you got left. So that was one thing. And the second thing I noticed, which was really crazy, was that there were so many homeless people in LA, so many everywhere, random places, legitimately sleeping in the middle of a, you know, of a street somewhere, pissing on the side of a wall. You saw a lot of, that's the first time I saw, I, I probably saw more human shit 
in LA than I've seen ever in my in time my entire life for sure like just everywhere and the stench as well is just another level due to the you know again you can just imagine how much it must reek in places like Skid Row especially when it's really warm like it's just not the best place at all and you know and most of these people that I saw that were homeless looked like they'd come from other places they didn't even look like they were from California again it's just from my own experience I can imagine I don't know if it's a thing that they shipped them in from other states but they didn't even they look like they were just big they were just like kind of it's all like um that was their mecca and it makes sense in it because you know the climate's good and of course maybe it's an affluent state so maybe there's more more possibility to panhandle and get more money from it i don't know but whatever it is i noticed it even just from being there just for a week to go you know to the camp vlog and festival i noticed it so i can only imagine what it's like living there you know day to day so it continues here it says the publishers um 75 employees based in los angeles are being given until october the first to decide whether to make the move boring said he said they look like 80 percent would make the move that's amazing isn't it because imagine how awesome that would be as an opportunity working for a company and they say, hey, we want to move to Nashville, Texas, right? Which is a, a state, I guess, where most people are thinking it's going to reopen sooner than other places in the States. It's a bit more uh, loose with the rules in that regard. Um, maybe they have more incentives for businesses to come down. Maybe there's taxes aren't that high. And just in general, if you're somebody earning a, a California wage and you're taking that down to Nashville, that's gonna that's gonna run that's gonna uh, that's gonna be a, a hefty bit of money for you in it that's gonna be a good amount for you to kind of put into a house an apartment a car do you know what I mean like that's a really really cool idea and eight percent is a good rate if they only lost 20 percent of employees during the move that's not too bad so the site has grown substantially um since its launch in 2015 and was the top publisher on facebook in july wow so they're big on facebook of course i don't use facebook so that makes more sense that i don't know i'm not familiar with the daily wire according to news uh, whip a ben shapiro show has ranked in a top 10 podcast this year according to PodTrack. the reasons for the company's plans uh to move are political boeing who has lived in los angeles the past 20 years blamed the city's leadership for failing to address the ongoing uh, um, urban problems and also cited the state's higher income tax i don't think that's political though. i just think because they're republicans People don't like them but i don't think that's political to say you're concerned about the homelessness and the high income tax right that's just you know uh, a lifestyle choice in that regard and it didn't some people just don't want to live in those kind of conditions and i'd imagine it's too especially during pandemic la is probably best at its best when everything's open right when you have access to the entire entertainment industry you have two of the biggest agencies headquarters out there caa and wme whatever was it whatever that the other one is right um everyone and everyone who's anyone passes through there one way or the other you have access to some of the best guests um great weather all that good stuff scenic views blah 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 so if all that stuff is taken away from you and you can't and you can't go outside right great restaurant scene as well you can't go outside normally what's the point i don't get I mean so i definitely understand um the decide to move but i don't think it's all political so continue to say, so the dream of california and the weather were enough to draw us all here and keep us here even when it was hard he said but it's hubris to think you can keep people you can keep making it worse for people and that somehow the idea of the temper the temperature winters will be enough to make them stay forever which is true he said that he plans to move in november and much of the staff will follow that he said la benefits from the fact that while it leans left it draws individuals um out to find their fame and seek their fortunes there are honorary bunch but they aren't so honorary um that is out of control government can break them he said that they considered move to texas but chose nashville because offers a creative talent that we need to keep growing the business he said we were shocked by the reception when we announced the move boring said but of course our employees see all of the same challenges we see and it's even harder for them to afford this place which is true um the daily wire has been headquartered in sherman oaks boring said duh, duh, duh. the interesting thing about la too is that regarding is that i remember everyone saying that like um housing was really expensive but then the odd thing was like getting around the city was really cheap by uber it was probably the cheapest place i've ever gone uber in my life like we were i was using it every single day of course in it because you have to get around the car no other option but it was ridiculously cheap like even cheaper than i remember going to an uber in new york and that was painful then i decided hey take the subway but yeah big news on the daily wire front interested to see if there's going to be other podcasts that are in LA, maybe Ruben Report is, is he in LA? I, mean, I think he might be. I want to see whether or not the other guys within that intellectual dark web crew will decide to move uh, to other places because I guess they can, man. If you've got a big enough reach 
and you get the numbers and you've got sponsors and stuff you don't need to be anywhere you can be location independent man and it's funny isn't it tim ferris's four-hour work week mantra is definitely being adopted by everybody in the industry basically for the most part right this location independency lifestyle design stuff is what everyone's essentially doing now um so yeah that book was ahead of his time but yeah big up to ben shapiro on that move in it that sounds great da, 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 da. Um, and then this is a quote actually yeah i've got this video actually. i want to see this video regarding the homelessness encampment spread across where la this is from nbc la as well let's check out what they're saying regarding the issue because i want to learn a little bit more as well about this whole thing because it's very very interesting to more beachfront homeless encampments it's a trend you've probably seen more of during the pandemic even though it's illegal new encampments have been popping up throughout la in the last five months mayor eric garcetti and la county officials vowed to get people off the streets during the pandemic but as nbc 4 i team investigator joel grover is finding the number of people living outside appears to have multiplied madness Two women beat the summer heat in a pool set up on a sidewalk at a new encampment in Venice. To fill the pool, they tapped into the water line from the building next door. Jesus Christ. In other parts of Venice, there are also new encampments on the beach, on the world famous boardwalk. A year ago, this encampment. And I wonder what they're doing in the States. Like, what are they honestly doing? There's, I remember Lex Friedman mentioning it, right? There's this sort of like quiet or silent um destroying of people's lives when it comes to economy when it comes to money but economy right when it comes to job prospects um especially when you're because i remember you know coming from a working class background right most of the issues i think i remember having at, at, in my home or arguments you know to, between my parents or even sometimes between myself and my siblings usually were around money usually were around like lack of opportunities and then that frustration spilling over or erupting in the household that's when most of the issues kind of came around and there was always this understanding there's always like this kind of silent understanding of you kind of everyone had a little ceiling right there was a ceiling that you you kind of had to break through it just it, it was what is what it is and no one's complaining about it you know you're from a disenfranchised area you don't have the much opportunities as everybody else you're not given a chance you kind of have to you know um really go out of your way to get just an opportunity to show yourself right it is what it is but that understanding of that knowledge of knowing that hey I'm going to have to work 10 times as hard as anybody else just to get a shot means that you're effectively aware of this ceiling you have over your head and you have to break that ceiling to, just to get a chance, not even to get the job, not even to increase your prospect of success, just to get a chance to interview, just to get a chance to show out. So I wonder for that group of people who are kind of distressed now, who are kind of going through real turmoil, who aren't able to work from home or work remotely because most of these those jobs, you know, to, you have to, you're kind of in a level of you're you're definitely a privileged bunch to be able to work somewhere like i am work on a laptop work remotely work in a coffee shop work at home wherever it may be right most people that are in that bracket of working class um are working in occupations that are hourly paid hourly paid places you usually have to go in there in person you have to be there in person to um exchange your time for money so i can only imagine what they're going through plus on top of this homelessness issues like you could legitimately see a future where people who are working in a regular you know hard work who hard working people who had a honest job working in the service industry somewhere whose job was taken away from them due to the pandemic due to responses um to the pandemic too by their government they had no prospects going forward uh stimulus checks weren't clearing and then suddenly you're on the streets i could see that happening and it could be a, a real increase in just regular folk who had no desire who had no who never saw themselves sleeping on the street one day right who never saw themselves um without a home who never saw themselves sleeping in the shelter or whatever it may be and now suddenly they are you know they have all their belongings in the backpack and they're panhandling on the street it could really happen very very quickly especially on the, in these times in front of venice's penmar golf course was just a few tents but now it's expanded Bloody to hell. almost a mile long wow. venice resident alan parsons it's a failure of the local government to address homelessness since the pandemic began new encampments are popping up all across la and, and no one's talking about is everyone's worried about catching trump sexually assaulting somebody saying a lie uh talking about biden's cognitive decline like if ever there was an issue right to deal with this would be one of them right a big issue to deal with and again what's the policy to change this nothing in it really taking up entire blocks that used to have no tents 
This encampment that used to cover just the sidewalk under the 101 freeway at Gower recently grew to cover the medians in the middle of the street, Jesus too. Christ. How have we surrendered to the fact that that's normal? Estella Lopez represents downtown businesses in the area that includes Skid Row. In addition to COVID, is the city worried about what else is growing underneath those encampments? Exactly. People are sitting in their own waste. Jesus we have Christ. had typhus. Jesus we have had Christ. tuberculosis, staph, ro rodents, fleas, <laughs> bed bugs. All of that is living in these encampments. Law enforcement tells the I team there are now more homeless on the streets for two reasons. First, starting in April, to stem the spread of COVID behind bars, California jails and prisons began releasing 3,500 nonviolent inmates out onto the streets. Skid Row has been a destination for people recently released from county jail when they don't have a home or friends or family Jesus to go to. Christ. Also, the city of LA stopped enforcing several laws during the pandemic. For example, they're not enforcing the ordinance that forbids the homeless from having bulky items at their tents. That's why you're now seeing huge encampments with sofas, mattresses, and yes, even wading pools. But I guess there's legitimately nothing they can do. Because I guess in some way, shape or form, they've put, they've put themselves in a, in a really bad position because they've not addressed it in any kind of way prior, the homelessness issue. Now that these people are on the streets and they legitimately have nowhere else to go, right? I'm sure they've not, you know, they've not built homeless shelters. I'm not too sure how it must cost a lot to actually maintain those shelters in the first place. Um, maybe the... The, the investment isn't worth the reward maybe the amount of people that come in um vis-a-vis -vis the people that go out and you know live a fruitful um constructive life where they become a valued member of society is pretty low and i'd assume i don't know it's just me guessing off the top of my head but just doing nothing also isn't the option too in it just leaving it to kind of run its course isn't the option because essentially what you're doing is that you're turning people Especially people that live in California who are probably, because um, the picture's so well, the people in the pool. You're turning people who are pretty kind hearted and have a big heart and really want to see the best in people, you're really turning them off homeless people, actually, because they're then encroaching into their lives, right? They already, you know, have a hard situation as it is. And then you're now, especially if you're a small business owner, imagine walking, you know, going up to, going to open your coffee shop or your little boutique and then you're having to essentially jump over tents in order to get to your front door like you it's definitely going to impact your business you'd assume right especially in a place like california where you'd imagine a lot of the people coming to those stores would be tourists or maybe would make up a huge chunk of the customer base so you know tourism tourists that don't know have no experience of you know what homelessness in california looks like will go there and be like completely turned off about going going there again so it's really gonna damage business in the long term Great. mayor garcetti has boasted this summer that more and more housing has been built for the homeless like this bridge home shelter in venice so to eric garcetti i would say that this is anything but a success the exactly. mayor's website says when a bridge home shelter opens the city will establish enforcement zones to ensure that tents are taken down when it opens it's not opened yet but all around that venice bridge home new tents are being set up all the time oh, during Jesus the pandemic Christ. Is that because the shelter is full? The I-Team obtained the occupancy figures from mid-July to mid-August. And out of 154 beds, only 124 were occupied. Oh, that Christ. means there were close to 30 vacancies. Why aren't these beds being used? Exactly. They do not allow drugs or alcohol within that facility. Uh, it comes with a curfew. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of these folks don't want to abide by the rules. The mayor has stated publicly that during the pandemic, no one who is homeless will be moved from their current location. He cites guidance from the CDC, which says moving anyone could help spread COVID. Jesus Christ, what a terrible situation to be in. So let's not move anybody because we're afraid to spread it. But then let's also not address the issue of homelessness because they don't want to because it's going to cost too much money because fundamentally people don't care because it's an odd one you'd imagine homelessness would be 
a real hot button topic for most politicians to get their teeth sunk into because that would provide for so many again it sounds crass but it'll provide for so many opportunities for real good photo moments right for photo ops you could really cement your legacy as the guy or the girl or the madame or the feet whatever right you could really cement your legacy as like i was the person who was responsible for halving a number of homeless people on the streets i was the one that had you know spearheaded this um I don't know, reintegration program, whatever. You could really, really make a big difference, right? You could really hold, you know, you could really let your nuts hang, for, for lack of a better term, if you decide to get your teeth sunk into the whole homelessness issue. Again, I know double entendre, you know, but hey, you could really do that, but no one does. I wonder what the issue is. Do, do voters not necessarily care about homelessness? Um, is it a top, is it something only really regulated to the areas that are worse affected? The San Fran's, the L, the California, I don't know, man. It's just a weird, weird, weird situation to be involved in. And again, that, that, that puts into context people like Joe Rogan deciding to move and go seek pastures new in it. It definitely puts all of that into context. So actually, before we end, talking about Joe Rogan, talking about mr jre big news for him and actually fu quite funny news in that respect um so this article came out via digital music news i'm not sure how reputable they are but the headline says Sp um, spotify employees demanding direct editorial oversight um oversight oversight over joe rogan podcast before they're published mad headline right because if you know anything about joe you'd know the one thing that he hates is people telling him what to do you get that impression anyway right he's the person that was rabbiting on and on about how amazing podcasts are the freedom it gives people to kind of do their own thing it's just him and jamie and a couple of people that uh, make jerry happen and it kind of goes against everything that he's had experience with you know doing um Oh, what's the show that he did? God Almighty, why has my head gone blank? Doing the, 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 the news radio and the other thing he did. Anyway, whatever show, right? So he, he's obviously got experience working within um, the regular, you know, corporate TV industry bullshit stuff. So he knows the other way the industry can be for you. So for him to have his own thing that he does with his own friends and he provides a platform for them to become more famous, he gives access to intellectuals and authors and publishers and whatever maybe to um, reach a bigger audience and just in general, right, kind of share his love for martial arts and all that sort of good stuff, hunting, blah, 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 blah. To finally get to the position now where he's at now where he's finally set, cemented his legacy. He's one of the sort of, you know, forefathers and um, real icons in the podcast and space for someone, you know, especially Spotify employees to think that they have any way of telling him what to do is very, very, very funny from the outside looking in. But it's also for me, a real big reminder of what it's like working in startups, right? And what it's like working for some of these tech companies, because unfortunately, I think Joe might not have known this, but most of these tech companies, especially the employees that happen to occupy operations and marketing, they're usually quite left leading. Um, I find that usually the engineers in startups are a little bit more conservative. Um, sometimes they keep it to themselves, but I always tend to find the more interesting debates and conversations regarding society or societal issues to usually come from the guys in engineering and usually uh, products and engineering usually i find those guys more interesting to speak to and they're a bit harder to get involved in and you know have any kind of long lasting relationship with because they have their little clicks and sometimes a few of them can be legitimately autistic you know which is a story for another day but i generally find that they are a lot more tolerant than the people that occupy the operations and marketing side of things so i'm not so, so i wouldn't be surprised if the people that are actually complaining about joe rogan that's what i find the employees definitely uh fit into one of those teams um, but it's funny because if you're Daniel Eck and you're the CEO of Spotify and you've essentially brought Joe Rogan in to spearhead your new, your new push for podcasts, you obviously want the Joe Rogan clout, you want that cosign, you know it immediately boosts your overall listenership, which is then going to allow them to raise more money um, in the stock market, you know how it works, right? You can, you know, you can add some zeros to your um, marketing deck or to your investment deck when he goes out and does meetings, obviously you can put him in his pitch deck as well. Well, there's loads of real benefits that come with just having a Joe's Rogan cosign, even though it's just a licensing deal. It comes with a lot of um, cool points. And of course, there's always the opportunity if you're Spotify to say, hey, this is only a licensing deal, but Joe Rogan might have such a great time on that platform. He might want to develop more shows. He might want to recommend friends. He might want to stay on whatever it may be right there there's always opportunity for the business to kind of continue after the term has the contract has basically come to its um contractual end 
Um, but having said all that, right, having said all that, the funny thing about it is that he probably should have known of this prior when you see, where is it? Da, 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 da. Yeah, when you see this video on YouTube that kind of spotlighted some of the staff members. So let's see, Spotify. Let's see if I can find it. I should have had it on the list staff. Where is it? I forgot what it was. This might be a good representation of just how different, um, yeah, just how different um politically or ideologically the people that work at spotify especially the people that would be offended about joe rogan's um political leanings about joe rogan's opinions about joe rogan's jokes um it probably should have been a sign for him to have known that this this was always going to end in tears so this is the video i was going to talk about it's a video from spotify titled transgender rights at spotify everyone just trusts each other and has this culture of it's okay to ask questions even if they might be difficult questions pronouns are kind of a, a tricky subject for me uh in that i keep going back and forth about kind of what what to use what to use where well i spent about 30 years or so like what do you think bard thinks when he listens to the joe rogan podcast what do you think bard thinks when he hears joe rogan you know taking the piss out of Caitlyn Jenner for the 70th time what do you think uh someone like Bard thinks when uh Joe Rogan's got you know um I don't know James Lindsay on and they're bemoaning um social justice warriors and they're shrieking about college campus students going you know irate because they wouldn't let him talk at some you know lecture somewhere what do you think he thinks about this a senior software engineer too so not some you know, num nut again, maybe goes against what I was saying about most engineers are conservative, but just bear with me. This is not some like, you know, some social media intern. This is somebody that kind of is part of the fabric of Spotify. Someone that probably has a lot of um, influence when it comes to some corporate decisions. So it really must be tricky. Again, if you're Daniel Eck, right, and you've brought Joe Rogan in as your whale, you, you're, you're pinning all your hopes on him for the next quarter, whatever it may be, right? And then to have your staff members who are integral for Spotify to get to position where they are now, right? And who have, you know, lived completely different lifestyles to what Joe Rogan lives. Um, or maybe, not, yeah, Joe, Joe Rogan's tolerant, don't get me wrong. But, the, you know, they wouldn't imagine they'd be friends, right? They probably have a very different view of how they view the world. Um, and, you know, they're allowed to coexist. But unfortunately, in this era that we live in at the moment, that's not possible. People want to either, it feels like we're living in an era where, it kind of reminds me of like Genghis Khan, right? Where it's like, in one sense, you could say Genghis Khan was a liberator, right? But in another sense, he was also a tyrant. But in 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 its purest form, he would always, you know, offer the option of like, join us or die. A really obviously bloody and gruesome death. But there was opportunity to kind of join my tribe or you die. And it feels like in this era, where that's what we're currently living in. We're living in an era where you either agree with my POV or you get cancelled and you never speak again. There's no like, let's agree to disagree. There's no, oh, um, I like hearing your side of things, but I'm going to stick to my side of things, right? There's no, there's none of that. There's no like, in, there's not even no intellectual conversation. There's no like, just te te back, back and forth. It's just my way of seeing the world is the right way. Your way is the wrong way. You have to be deleted if you don't join me. So you can just imagine them not being friends only because of that. I think in a, in a, in a more optimistic uh, world, right? A world where people had maybe progressed past this stupid infantile cancel culture thing that we have going on at the moment and were okay with letting people make mistakes, okay with maybe forgetting giving somebody right you don't hear that too often people saying right you only hear that in a religious sense you don't even hear people saying oh i'm gonna forgive this person um you don't we don't even give people the benefit of doubt even anymore sometimes right someone can do a million and one good things and then the moment they do one slightly bad thing loads of stories start coming out about them being a complete monster when prior no one's had nothing to say so that's kind of the issue at the moment so if you're joe rogan and you're looking at this video and you're looking at some of the staff members on here and how passionately they're speaking about um sports Spotify Bard here said um they had been at Spotify for what 30 plus years like you just imagine the 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 feathers he's ruffling in that office uh, just by being there alone and again it goes to show like Joe Rogan did us in the beginning hey I'm taking this deal it's just a license deal nothing's gonna change but we've already seen the changes mate you know what I mean like shows up episodes are missing no explanation on that regard cool no problem it's your stuff do what you want to do but then 
now we have the situation where suddenly he's apologizing for stuff he does apologize don't get me wrong but the way he did it the fact that it came after it was something so innocuous as you know this forest fire stuff which he probably ended up making it worse anyway by apologizing in the first place because not many people i guess cared about it i would assume in general but hey let's continue with the video so in the closet because my previous employers didn't have any particular tolerance for for transgender people at Spotify, we have employee resource groups, and Spectrum is our LGBTQ plus employee resource group. At Spotify, having a diverse workforce and being an inclusive is important so everyone can feel like themselves at work. So what we did is to come up with a list of essentially every medical procedure that trans people might need. Basically, Spotify said, oh, we didn't realize there was a problem there. We'll fix it. And that was pretty amazing. As of 2019, we now offer masculinization and feminization treatments recommended by wow. the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. It's not a question of vanity. You know, for someone who needs these things, it's really a question of being able to be perceived, you know, as themselves. At Spotify, everyone's part of Spotify. Everyone's a member of the band, and everyone is determined to help everyone else who needs it. My advice is don't be afraid. There's nothing wrong with knowing who you are and where you stand. Part of what I'm doing here is trying to be visible so people who are like me know that they're not alone. So after seeing that, you can, you're not surprised now that um, <laughs> some store bought by staff are going to be like, you know what, let's get this Joe Rogan guy out of the paint. So this article from Digital Music News says the following, a group of Spotify staffers are now reportedly pushing to introduce direct editing oversight for the Joe Rogan experience before the episodes go live. That includes content flags, trigger warnings, reference to fact-checked information, or simply refusing to publish episodes at all. Jesus Christos. Um, the demands follow a string of controversial comments by Joe Rogan, who was lured into Spotify uh, in a massive hundred million dollar deal. Rogan's appeal to millions of listeners is unfiltered and un uh, um, irreverent approach, though that style isn't sitting well with the activist group of Spotify staffers who say it needs to be reined in. Earlier this month, uh, Digital Music first reported that multiple podcast episodes were missing following a migration to Spotify platform that included controversial interviews from the likes of Alex Jones, Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, Gavin McGuinness, also missing episodes with right-wing figures such as Owen Benjamin, Stephen Molyneux, and Charles C. Johnson. So, obviously, that's the issue in it at hand, isn't it? The fact that it's, you can say because again i love joe rogan right i listen to every single episode i don't care who's on i listen to it all the time i follow him on social um i drink coffee that he drinks i use kettlebells i watch mma i, I did a bit of jujitsu i did muay thai part mostly or you know yeah mostly due to joe rogan so i'm a big fan of the guy right but you can't deny that the warning signs should have been there for any any fan of joe rogan the moment those those episodes went missing from the migration over because initially what happened when they migrated over is that we kind of all assumed that oh because it takes a while for the RSV to populate that those missing those missing episodes will probably pop up because I think it wasn't any coincidence that those ones that are missing were also the ones that kind of went over the three hour marks and some of them were like 320 a couple of them might be in four hours so it kind of made sense that they weren't around then when we didn't hear an explanation from joe regarding it right and which is again he doesn't he doesn't really loves to explain stuff the more people push him to explain the more he refuses in in general he's quite stubborn in that way but I, in terms of it being a content um censorship sort of issue you would assume he would be willing to clear it up quickly because he hates censorship right that's the one reason why he decided to leave youtube um and potentially you know other platforms that the podcast is on like apple because he was kind of um put aback by how the tech companies essentially unilaterally decided to cancel alex jones right all in unison um based off kind of you know he's i guess his um statements regarding the sandy hook shooting but in general right that kind of maybe you know censorship is a big deal to joe Rogan, right he had bloody jack dorsey sitting down for like what three or four episodes going back and forth around you know what was going on in censorship on twitter and whatever maybe so you'd assume he would come out and say something the moment he didn't and the moment he tried to leak the news to alex jones and convince alex jones that it wasn't that and that he's supposed to be he's gonna have a greatest hits on the youtube channel all this sort of bullshit 
that was already the warning sign for me of like, okay, Spotify definitely putting a foot down because he made it seem like in the beginning that this is just a licensing deal. I'm taking the money just to license it. And I think if you're being adult, grown up about this, you should understand, especially if you've worked in corporate companies, if you've worked for a startup, you should know whenever any company invests that kind of money, those kind of zeros to somebody, they're going to have some influence on what that person does. Now, it might not be direct. It might not be just, it might not be exactly what they're asking for, where it's direct editing oversight. It might just be influence in terms of having them in your back of your head, right? Because they're sending you many emails, they're inviting you to meetings, whatever it may be, or because of stuff they said in public, they're going to have some sort of um, indirect influence over what you're doing. It's just unavoidable. You can't take 100 M's from a company and they just do what you want. It just doesn't work that way. Again, it was optimistic to feel that. It was optimistic for us to hope that would be the case because we all love Joe. And the fact that he's a little bit of a podcasting pirate, he kind of, you know, um, moves to the beat of his own drum. But especially when he started to stop, he, he stopped doing the live streams on YouTube because things were getting flagged and he was worried about his channel maybe getting taken down due to strikes. It kind of felt like that he was already compromising in ways you wouldn't have assumed he would have not compromised. It, he was adjusting in ways you wouldn't have thought he would have adjusted in years gone by. He might have probably decided to go and make his own platform. I don't know, whatever. But he, the fact that he went to stay on there and just kind of play by the rules in some way, shape or form showed that, you know, again, the older you get, the more unlikely you are to always be fighting against things, right? You just get tired. You just want to kind of just live life and be chill. But I think the moment 1M's clears your account, you just have to accept that you're going to have to make some adjustments in order to make the other partner happy in some way, shape or form. It continues here, it says, but despite the glaring omissions, Spotify staffers, staffers are now stepping up their demands to control more of Rogan's content. First, uh, Vice first reported that on Spotify employees have conducted more than 10 meetings to discuss the possible changes. Those discussions include proposals for outright removal of um, additional podcast episodes. And again, the interesting part about it, if you're a Spotify employee, imagine giving imagine caring that much about some random guy because again joe rogan's an influence influential guy don't get me wrong but he's still just a dude he's just a dude happens to be very successful at what he does but he's just a guy right he's not a politician he's not a member of congress he's not you know what i mean i guess he can be influential in that way but imagine caring that much about fact checking a guy that's smoking weed smoking cigars drinking whiskey shooting shit with his friends but then you're not kind of putting the same demands on news networks such as CNN and Fox News that from the outside looking in are really stoking the fires and essentially um, dividing the nation, right, in what they're doing and how they're covering um, the politics of America and the issues that, you know, affect, um, you know, everyday Americans. You'd assume they are probably a greater enemy to the overall health of that nation than Joe Rogan's podcast. You would assume so, wouldn't you? So to kind of... Um, go after him and tell him to delete shows or take things down trigger warnings is just so reductive it really really is man it really really is because you hope again let them have what they want right and you honestly think life would improve that much for people for your regular everyday american out in there like suffering now during the pandemic i don't think so um, and there's also a part of me that's like hey your stuff remember at, at spotify 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 um you know, like if anything, Daniel Ek could easily say that, you know, the hiring of Joe Rogan was essentially was partly due to him wanting to secure the futures of everyone that works for him, right? To ensure that they're able to clear payroll, to ensure that people's um, stock options are worth something going forward. Because, you know, I still have the feeling that Spotify would most are more, are more likely than not than any other platform have the potential to shoot themselves in the foot by dropping the ball on maybe moving into, you know, maybe they refuse to move into tech um essentially how they've sort of like you know got in bed with some of the record labels that could come back and bite them in the ass there is possibility that spotify is not going to keep exponentially growing the way it is and become more popular it might hit a point where people just move off and go into the next thing so there's no guarantee so if you're daniel Eck and you finally get your organ on you're sort of doing it in the hopes of having some level of guarantee in terms of you know exposure revenue all this sort of stuff so to have your staff members demanding you to take that guy off the platform is like no he's paying for your wages so so but again as a ceo part of the reason of ceo is like a you're like a chief what they call some some people call it a chief energy officer you're essentially responsible for making sure you set the tone so if you set the tone in your company of that you know they have 11 meetings about this guy or 10 sorry and then you completely ignore what they say that's going to set a weird precedent
You know, people want want to work for that company, or they'll just think that their voice is not being heard in any way, shape, or form. And there's nothing that, in, in there's nothing worse than working in a place where everyone feels like they can't say what they want to say, or they feel like as if what they're saying isn't getting paid attention to. It's the whole, it's the worst. Trust me, I've been in those scenarios. I've been in those lunch rooms. It's really, really awkward. It continues here. So the particular focus in earlier conversations featuring the author Abigail Schreier, I mentioned that previously. It says part of the um rationale is that spotify already exerts control over content like playlist even those created by outside creators so why not extend that oversight that is really telling i didn't know that they have they have they have influence over playlists that other curators make why do they have control over that so if i make a playlist and starts popping off what they what can they do take songs off reorder them that doesn't make any sense that's a mad i didn't know that that's very revealing it continues says, um, this has reportedly gone all the way up to the top, though Spotify CEO Daniel Ek appears to be pushing back. From a business standpoint, the reason is fairly obvious. Joe Rogan's audience like his direct, unedited style and could easily abandon the comedian podcaster if he's edited. That might explain why the Sharia podcast is still alive, though a strange development um, emerged earlier today. In episode, Joe Rogan alleged that a left-wing activist had intentionally set wildfires in states of Oregon, a claim refuted by the FBI and other officials. He said, I officially... So I actually love Portland. It's one of my favorite places to perform. Most of the people there are very nice, but there's madness going on there. You want to talk about the madness of the crowds. That exemplifies that right now. They arrested people for lighting forest fires up there. They arrested left-wing people for lighting forest fires there. Air court activists. This stuff isn't widely being reported. So again, bad thing I mentioned in, my, in another clip of on the show but again this isn't anything out of the norm for Joe Rogan isn't it he talks about you know ayahuasca and aliens and Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster and serial killers drug like this is just one of those stories that you just kind of throw out there hoping that it might be true but to, to, for this one statement regarding something that you can't categorically say isn't happening either right you can't I don't know if they can categorically say that but I'll assume looking from the outside in that there is a possibility that some of these forest fires are being set by men or are, are man 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 made or whatever that term is um to suggest other so just putting out there isn't misinformation now maybe saying categorically that they're doing this or that they're purposely doing this to what uh, um essentially uh bring you know just, you know set wreak havoc on a nation that's one thing but i don't see this as anything out of the ordinary for a standard joe rogan podcast show actually um it continues here oh, it says apology blah 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 so um, of course, um, that little of the an oversight could create a serious rift between Rogan and Spotify. Beyond that, it could also constitute a breach of contract, which would give Rogan an exit from the deal. Now, this is something that I'm not too sure about. I'm not too sure people put too much faith into contracts. I don't think contracts. It depends. Maybe if you're Joe Rogan and you're that much of a killer and you've been successful this much in your, for this long in your life, it's probably because you're not that dumb, right? So because you have some really smart people in your team who are able to put in some really clear, concrete terms into your contract so that he does. Because, you know, like I said, Joe, Joe Rogan's very picky about the things that he does. He's very particular about not wanting to do more than what he's already doing. And he's very careful about who he aligns himself with. So I'm sure if they did do a deal that there was something in place of like, hey, I do this thing and you do that thing and then that's it there's no overlapping so that might be it but i don't know how detailed that would be in a contract about hey um you can't suggest or give me any insights on my show because it would breach contact i'm not just sure if that's true i don't know again i don't know maybe because and again did they give him the money up front was it based on milestones was it terms of condition based like i wonder what the deal is with that because that would probably explain a lot of it because if they can get away with just you know, imagine they sign a hundred million dollar deal, but it's only twenty percent upfront, and the rest comes after he hits some certain milestones. They could probably be able to write that off just for the sake of keeping some of their stuff, especially if it's like senior engineers and stuff who are really hard to replace, right? Um, especially some of the better ones. You don't want to be in a position where they're all leaving because of one person, right? You need to choose the option that serves a greater good. But again as a fan of the show and as a fan of Spotify too, as a service, like they're going to lose a lot of listeners overnight if they decide there will be so much bad press on both ends. I think if they keep on going with the show, um, the left wing media um, are definitely going to, you know, come down them like a ton of bricks. And if they do end up um, taking it off, then the people who are rational, the people who are kind of looking for that kind of unfiltered raw podcast shows on Spotify, they're not getting that kind of hit on there. They're going to, 
be up in revolt as well and you know i mean they'll, i'm assuming a lot of them will probably vow never to use spotify again and stuff like that so it's not an enviable decision to be in but i think again for me looking from the outside in i just think this was inevitable i don't think there was any way shape or form joe rogan could get 100 million m's and not have any kind of and not relinquish some sort of response not some sort of creative control it would be optimistic for him to suggest so for to think so i think the fans were hopeful that that would be the case um but it's just you can't do it you can't get to bed with a big corporation and not expect to get fucked in some way shape or in some way shape or form it's just bound to happen there's no ways it cannot happen that way um but yeah let's see man let's see going forward what happens with joe um i hopefully they don't do that hopefully they just leave him alone but i have a theory that i have a feeling that this won't last i don't think it is gonna last it's gonna be too much trouble for what it's worth especially you know having just newly moved your family to an entire new location to then be dealing with all these you know um spotify employees being angry at you and feeling as if like you're putting the people that you know secured the deal in a bad position i don't know it just seems to be not to be worth the squeeze especially if you've got the money in your back pocket you know, who gives a shit so let's see what happens going forward let me know your thoughts down below do you think joe should um what to give them the middle finger do you think daniel x should back him more in public the, the spotify ceo or do you think the spotify employees are within their right to say hey we were here before this guy um we built this company with our liberal blue haired um you know selves right you can take the piss out of us so much we want but we are integral to his company so you should be able to choose us over him or it's either him or us kind of thing let me know in the comments down below anyway that's your listening to Jingle Show, episode number one, no, one, episode number three, seven, six. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. If it's your first time listening via the podcast show, make sure you download that show. Leave me a five-star review and share with your friends. If you're watching via YouTube, please make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. And of course, please support the show via Patreon at patreon.com for the Agostino. That's patreon.com for the Agostino. For let us one pound per month, you can get access to my entire audio library as well as this show in full HD before it comes out anywhere else on patreon.com for slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o make sure you join out there do not delay get on there before it's too late but until then people take care be safe peace